So I'm curious to find out, by show of hands if you want to admit this, how many of you listened to the chair of the Federal Reserve a few weeks ago give her report? Anybody listen to that? Anybody pay attention to what was said or anything that came afterward? Okay, so some of us were going on. So I sat and I listened because I always find it fascinating. Because if you're not fully aware of it, as she speaks, there are armies of people who are listening for every word that comes out of her mouth to imagine how they might plan for the future, what the markets might do, how to respond, whether or not to buy and sell. And this is how our economy is impacted. So we ought to pay close attention, said the lights going up. As I listened to, there, there's, uh, I, I think someone's out here trying to fix the lights. I hear them. You can't hear them. I can hear them. All you see is the lights going off and on. So there's no magic involved. Here. <laughs> so as I listened, the last time, and I was reflecting on it, these words actually came, I wrote this down in my journal, and it said, so it looks like the high priests of the gods of man spoke an oracle today, which many interpreters are trying to find out. What will it mean for investors, for workers, for monetary policy? Only time will tell if we haven't interpreted their oracle correctly and if the market gods are appropriately pleased. We don't often think of it that way, but let's be honest. Some of what they're doing sounds an awful lot like the priests bringing an oracle. Because they're never certain. They're never sure. They have an idea about how things might go. They can read the tea leaves well. And there are talented folks who do this. But in the end, the truth is that something always can be there that we never expected. I don't make light of this because there are very real implications of what happens because of what the Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen says and does with our monetary policy. It impacts us whether we're even aware of it or not. But in some ways, whenever I watch their quarterly dance, it always feels to me like Pharaoh's magicians coming in, or King Nebuchadnezzar turning to the Magi to read the handwriting on the wall. That's from Daniel, by the way, in case you didn't know that saying. That's what they do. I share all this to say at the end of the day, it is really hard to plan for the future. It's difficult because in our, even in our own personal lives, there's much that is beyond our control. As much as we don't, don't like to admit that. We can look for ways to be more strategic about our ministry as well. We can look for ways to sustain and grow our ministry. And as we do this in this time for us as a community, it's helpful to look back. That's often how we understand where we might be going in our lives. Looking back, to see the patterns in our own personal lives. Where have I done well? Where do I repeat patterns of, of self, self-sabotage, I think is the word. How do I do things so that I don't continue to do, make the mistakes of the past? As I look back on the history of our own congregation that goes well beyond any of us in these pews, we have to remember that God has always had a plan for us, even when Westminster was worshiping in a tobacco warehouse. Oh, nobody remembers that, right? Yeah, that predates all of us a very long time ago. We didn't even have a building, and yet there were our four parents worshiping, seeking to be faithful to God. Even when the clerk of the session locked the doors of the church and wouldn't let anybody in for a few years, that was during the Civil War, God still had a plan. Oh, I wasn't going to pick on Sharon. Uh, she didn't lock the doors of the church, obviously. But even back then, when the church couldn't come together, God had a plan. God was still there in their midst. And even as the neighborhood around the church all those years ago began to change and was unsettling to the folks who were already here, God was still at work and is still at work right now. In, I believe, new and exciting ways. But also in ways that we're not certain.
about. And it's that uncertainty that the market gods do not like. In case you haven't heard that, markets don't like uncertainty. Well, we don't like uncertainty either. And that is how they are like us. But the truth is, this isn't just Westminster's story. This isn't just our economic story. This is the story of the Bible. Let me give you some examples. Things had been going well for this immigrant group of people. They had built large cities and they had thrived under the protection of a Pharaoh who was favorable to them because one of their own had helped them, the Joseph, had helped them build the empire of Egypt. But then things changed, things they could not imagine that would happen. The Pharaoh decided that they were their now enemy. And so they started killing off all of the babies, the male children, because they wanted to get rid of them. No one in that community could have imagined in any of their strategic planning that somehow Pharaoh would change his mind and start killing off their children. No one could plan that. And yet, in the midst of that, in the midst of that, God was present and active and at work, undermining the oppression. It took a long time, but it happened. And the people did what they had to do to survive. And if they hadn't, Moses would have been killed. They hit him and broke the law. So here was an example of how to live in the midst of changing times that we did not expect. And then we can fast forward to the stories. There's plenty of them. I'm only going to share three, I think, think thematically. Otherwise, we'll be bored after the third one. Maybe you're already bored. Then there was a time when the southern kingdom believed that they were invincible. They believed that God resided inside the temple. And that because of that, it meant that the empires of the world could not beat them, that they were invincible. And so they made plans accordingly. And Jeremiah came along and said, this is all going to end. He was told, you know, you're not supporting the troops when you say such things. That's actually in there. You're a troublemaker. You're just a Debbie Downer. I don't think they exactly used those words. But then, in the midst of all of this belief, it all came crumbling down because their mighty warriors lost. And they exiled all of the people who were of privilege. And then while they're sitting in exile, thinking, wow, our entire world has been upended, Jeremiah then writes these words on behalf of God. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for your harm. To give you a future with hope. And then you will call on me and pray to me and I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back, back to the place from which I sent you into exile. End quote. God says in the midst of this destruction and exile that I have not left you. And in fact, I plan to give you hope and a future. But these are still troubling words. After 70 years. That's a lifetime. To imagine that God's promises exist beyond our own lifetime and that we can give thanks for them, can be a little unsettling for those of us who get bored in our fast-paced consumer culture. If it didn't happen last week or yesterday, and if it isn't going to happen the next few weeks, why does it matter to me? Imagine caring about a future that doesn't involve us. Planning for a future that doesn't involve any of us gathered in this space here. And yet there were people before us who were doing just that. Whether they even wanted us sitting here at this time and place, they were still planning for it because they knew that God had a future and a hope that was beyond them. And then we'll fast forward to Jesus. During the Roman occupation, Yes, God had restored the people of Israel, brought them back 
into the promised land, but they were no longer the great power that they had once believed themselves to be, and for the rest of their existence, lived under the thumb of one empire after another. And at the time of Jesus, Rome was that empire. Then, in the midst of that empire, at the corner edge, you have this wilderness preacher who comes along and says, another one is coming. The one to whom Isaiah spoke, and Jesus shows up. And at first, the people think, oh, military Messiah, we're going to overthrow it all. But God had other plans. Jesus says, pick up your cross. In each one of these and other stories are powerful witnesses for us to hear and understand that we've been given tools and witnesses and signposts of how we might live in uncertain times. God doesn't say, don't worry about the future, don't plan the future, or it'll magically take care of itself, don't worry about it. In fact, Jeremiah, the same prophet who said 70 years, is the same prophet who right as the city is being destroyed, goes out in symbolic fashion and buys up to fields. What he's doing is, is twofold. One is he's planning ahead. Now, I don't know about if, if y'all know what happens, that when a country gets invaded, all those people who have property rights lose those property rights. You, you might have been aware of this. I'm going to give you an example of this. When we invaded Iraq, there were two countries who were particularly unhappy about us invading Iraq. You may not remember who they were, France and Russia, because they had licenses to all of the oil fields. And they knew as soon as we invaded, they would lose those licenses to the oil fields. So here you have, fast forwarding now, right, or reversing, going back to Jeremiah. He's going to buy these fields and know that the deeds to those properties won't mean anything unless he's got an army to back it up with. And yet, he buys them anyway, knowing that after 70 years, they will be back there. It won't even be his name on the property, but someone who they'll pass along for the prophetic community will stand as a symbol to say, we will plan for a future that we do not know. And that is a powerful witness that gives, I believe, us an opportunity to stand strong and faithful and understand that even when the greatest plans we lay out for the day fall flat, that our desire to keep moving forward is what God calls us to do. Emily Town says that the life of discipleship at the end of the day is a process. It's not something that we come to at some point. It's why we call it a journey. It's a journey, as she says, of false starts and modest successes. All along this end goal to live into our fullest humanity which means seeing everyone as brother and sister. It means living in the image of Jesus Christ, which meant to share love, to be in community, to break down the dividing walls of hostility. But in his words from the passage this morning, if you're anything like me, they're disturbing. Because you look at them and think, how on earth can we do that? Are you really seriously calling us to hate our families? I, I'm uncomfortable with the language there. I, I hope you are too. I imagine I'm seeing heads move. So, unless we begin to unpack, what was Jesus actually talking about? Was he setting policy for all time? Or was he talking about a particular context? Well, you probably already know that it's the latter. He wasn't saying that our goal as disciples is to hate all of our families. That wouldn't make sense. And it's also important to know here that the, lang the word we translate hate for us is emotional language. We see that as this visceral feeling of just wanting to, well, whatever, you want to fill the gap there. But the hate here isn't about emotion, it's about action. It's about how we order our lives. Now, one of the things to remember is in that ancient world, the family, the clan, as we might call it today, was the centerpiece. Despite what Rome was up to, they had to work with these various clans that were bigger than just your nuclear family. They were cousins and uncles and aunts and blood relatives that you probably didn't even know. And that, that, that your whole life was ordered by being loyal to whatever the family said. 
Now we talk about the importance of having a strong, loving family, and that can be a great joy, but it can also be a tool of manipulation. And what Jesus is pushing here in this clan structure is to say anything that stands in the way of giving ourselves fully to following Jesus and knowing that the family doesn't have an end. All involved, where we're all part, and so our loyalty is to all the people of the earth, not just to our own clan. Now, in order to understand this better, I did some searching recently and came across an interesting writing from an organization called Somali Christian Ministries. Now, if you know anything about Somalia, it is what we would call considered nowadays a failed state. They haven't had a recognized government in that country for 14 years. And yet, there are Christians there. Somali Christians who are working to break down the dividing walls of hostility there. But there was an article on one of their websites that talked about clan and what it meant. And so I thought I would share what they said to give you some idea about the power and to what Jesus, I believe, is talking about as opposed to hating your own family in some sort of emotional hatred. Here it is. They write, Many Somalis believe that being a Somali is better than being born in some other nationality. And most Somalis, if not all of them, believe that it is important for them to stay within their clan. Westerners do not understand the concept of a clan, so let me explain. In Africa, a clan is an extended family originating from one ancestor. Clan members are included in a clan through genealogies. All of the members of a clan are related by blood, and there are many blood relatives from many, many different aunts and uncles. There are brothers and sisters from the same father, but perhaps that father had up to four wives and many children with each one. The clan is known by its family name. In Somalia, there will be clans fighting against other clans, and sub-clans fighting against sub-clans, and even sub-clan fighting against another sub-clan. Somalis from outside Somalia send money back home to help support their clan and in time to help support warlords. A Somali born into a clan will, clan will depend on the clan for food, water, protection, and attack from other clans. He goes on to say, in Africa your name represents which clan you belong to. It is like your social security identity card. Wherever you go, you are first asked what clan you belong to and then are treated accordingly. If you meet some, someone from another clan that has a blood feud with your clan, you may be attacked or killed. Somalia's civil war is based upon clans fighting for economic and political control of certain cities and parts of cities and various parts of countries. Somalia is the only country in the world without a recognized government, and it has been like that for 14 long years, mostly because of clan loyalty. Now again, this is one individual writing about his understanding of how it works. And I've heard it said in similar ways before. What Jesus, and where they end up going in the very, very long article, is to say that if we talk about Jesus being that which reconciles us, that we have to identify that which divides us first. If you're in a situation like this where your life and your health depend on remaining loyal to this particular clan, despite whether you agree with what's going on or not, to then decide to quit means then to begin to understand what it means to hate. If you leave and no longer follow them, you're now doing what is hateful in action, even if not in heart. To pick up the cross means that there will be struggles. And so for our Somali brothers and sisters in Christ who struggle with this dual loyalty, we don't just share their story to point them out and say, look, they've got stuff to figure out. The harder part is for us to bring that home. I think we like to believe that in our own lives, none of us have that kind of clan loyalty to anything. But I begin to think that if we in our own culture stop for a minute and think, is there one overarching power that exists in our lives, we have to admit that it is, at the end of the day, our economic system. 
Now, I've been labeled a communist before, and I'm not, it's not where I'm going, and I'm not suggesting another economic system. What I'm saying is if we can't criticize it, then it's become a god. Anything we cannot criticize and critique and look for ways to make better has moved into the realm of God. We need money to survive. We live on the debt system. Our interest that we get comes from all sorts of things, and I am not an expert on this, but what I do know is that it seems to thrive on low-cost labor. And at some point, it, that ends up being bad for all of us. Now, I don't have an answer for this, right? What I'm saying is that I think we need to take a hard look at the world around us and figure out ways to humanize the economic systems that we are part of in a small way. Maybe that means going to the grocery store and refusing to go through the self-checkout line, making them have to hire more people as opposed to replacing them. Now maybe that's not a solution. That was one that Mary Spencer used to share with me on a regular basis. That was her way of doing it. It always challenged me to do the same, and in doing so, try to interact with those who are serving me. And as an introvert, that's something I particularly like, is that lane where I then don't have to act, interact with anyone. But I have learned to overcome that. But that's not a plan for everyone, and frankly, that's not a way to up in anything. But it is a way for us to begin thinking, how will we live more humanely in these systems? Because Jesus did not come along and say, let's replace Rome with the new system that I have for you in place. What he said was, love other people. Proclaim that the kingdom of God has come me. Share what you have. <coughs> Follow me. And remember that all people are your brothers and sisters. It was at the end of the day the empire that couldn't handle it. And when he said, pick up your cross, he knew that our journey of faith might take us to some difficult places. The truth of the matter is we can't even begin to predict or control the winds of change in our own lives. We do not know. We cannot fully rely on the gods of the market to be pleased with our best planning. We cannot control everything that will happen with our own health. We can make all of the best choices and care for ourselves and do what the doctors tell us, and yet, then things still might go wrong. We cannot control, ultimately, what happens with other people, what they do, what they think, whether they like us or not. <coughs> but we can control our walk of faith. We can begin to put feet to our prayers. We can act out our faith in concrete ways. Each day, over along and fits and starts and not beat ourselves up, just be gracious and continue. There was a church in East Germany, right near the border, that once the country was divided, for years the pastors of that church would have a regular prayer service for peace. In its early days, there were two or three people, but it grew but never more than 10 or 15 at any time, every week, week after week. But as things got closer to the end of the separation, right in the, in the years leading up to the wall, more and more young people were going to the service for peace. And in the weeks before when the wall came down, thousands upon thousands of people were showing up every week at this church for prayers of peace. Throughout all of those years, that community of faith was simply preparing itself for a future they did not know and probably couldn't even imagine. When the country that they lived and loved changed completely. But they were being prepared nonetheless for a future they could not predict. And I believe that is our call. To plan for a future we cannot predict which means we do our best. We use the best of our imagination that God has given to us and have a sense about where God is calling us to love and serve. 
and trusting that it might not be in our own lifetime, but it won't matter if it is or isn't. Because God is still at work. And that is our call. Today, tomorrow, and each day of our lives.